you got a broker, networking, partnerships, going direct. You got two deals. I closed my first deal three weeks ago, closed my second deal two weeks ago, and I'm closing my third deal tomorrow <laughs> and uh, wholesaling one deal that doesn't fit my buy box. So how do I find deals? Is it through a broker? Is it through cold calling? You know, I'm like, everything. All the above. All the above. <laughs> Get the partnerships, river. networking. Yeah, it's yeah. got to be, I mean, everything. You got to be in the right place at the right time. For sure. And you got to put yourself in a position where you have those relationships. Welcome everybody to Self Storage Income. And today's podcast, I'm really excited about. Um, show, thank you so much for joining me and Connor today. Uh, I think you're, what you've done is inspiring and I, I'm really proud of you, dude. I mean, the growth and everything's incredible. So just uh, before we dive into this real quick, um, Show joined our in, inner circle six months ago. About six months, yep. And you're now on your third storage facility, which hopefully we'll be closing here. They're signing the paperwork here. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Nice. Fantastic. That's <laughs> Amazing. So well, why don't you give a little background? You know, tell people who you are. You're 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 new in this game and you're killing it already. So uh let's let, go back a little, give people some background. Yeah, for sure. And first I want to say special thanks to you, man, because you know I've moved fast, but being in your inner circle and you know be able to talk to you has really helped me a lot. So special thanks to you. Um, so my background, um, so I founded an e-commerce company called Buffy. Uh, we do you know sheets, comforters, pillows, your bedding products, all from natural or sustainable materials. Uh, and started that five years ago and slowly over time said, well, I need to focus on you know, other businesses or other ways to generate wealth. And I said, what's the most tried and true thing to create long-term wealth for myself and my family? It's real estate, right? Yep. Um, so I actually started taking the earnings from the e-commerce side and started investing as an LP in various real estate, different classes. So I did hospitality, hotels, I did storage, I did multifamily, and just realized that storage was crushing it out of all of them, right? And I said, well, I think this is where I need to spend my time, right? If I want to create long-term wealth, I need to be in storage. Mm -hmm. um, so I pulled the plug. Uh, in earnest, I started last October, so it'll be 12 months yeah. next month. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I've been, been going hard at trying to find deals. I closed my first deal three weeks ago, Closed my second deal two weeks ago, <laughs> and I'm closing my third deal tomorrow. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, wholesaling one deal that doesn't fit my buy box. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's uh, incredible. Now, I think that's, you know, a lot of people listening to this are going to go, wait, wait what? <laughs> four weeks in your four deals here. Yeah, no and kidding. And like, uh, that's, I mean, that's just awesome. Now, a lot of people too, we hear are saying, oh, we can't find deals, we can't get them done or whatnot. Uh, but that's not stopping you at all. And when you started, you know, thinking about this and saying last October, saying, okay, I want to go into this, um, you knew storage because you'd invested as an LP and you said, now it's time for me to take, build something for my own, right? Um, you mentioned your buy box. Where, how did you even look at getting started? Like what, it, it, this can be daunting to even a lot of people, right? It, even people that are in the game trying to scale, it can still be daunting to think, where do I go? What am I looking for? What's that next buy? So how did that process work for you? Yeah, so in the beginning, it was consuming a lot of information, right? And there's so much material out there, right? There's your book, podcasts, other people have you know books and podcasts. And actually, I actually started out at a interesting place with knowledge consumptions, which is I was just looking at, OMs, right? Yeah. There's operators out there who are trying to bring investors on. And yeah. I just read all the OMs. I asked them for their model, yeah. right? And I Smart. went through the model. And that's how I actually learned about storage. Love that. Um, and then, you know, from there, and first of all, I love Google Sheets. I love Excel, right? I love yeah. models. So that was really fun for me and exciting for me. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think I really learned, like, what, what's what's the strategy in storage, right? What what are What's the playbook people are bringing to storage? And then I started listening to your podcast, I read your book, 
And, um, you know, that, that gave me some good knowledge and tools in my toolkit to say, all right, if I'm going to buy a facility, what do I need to focus on? Um, and you know, it, it was kind of incremental steps over time, which is you consume high level knowledge, right? And then you start to consume more detailed knowledge, whether that's, you know, how to find your first deal, yeah. how to underwrite that deal, yeah. right? What materials you need from the seller, um, and to like, all right, when you lock in a deal, how are you going to operate it? Especially your first 30, 60, 90 days. Yeah. Um, so I just consumed all that knowledge and was, uh, applying it directly myself, um, I was doing my old cold, cold calling in the beginning. Then I hired a VA. I said, my time's too valuable for this. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, just, you know, baby steps. And, and it took several months. Uh, but I think being consistent, um, being motivated and saying the deal is going to come, that was really helpful. Yes. How did you determine that buy box? So when you were putting it together, how did you figure out what you your strategy was? Was it predicated on where you lived? Was it... A type of asset? Was it operations? Like what was your thought process on the buy box? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it developed by first saying where I live, right? So I'm in yeah. Texas yep. uh, and I actually grew up in Orlando, Florida. So I said, I know those two markets, right? And there's some comfort level there. Yeah. So I said, all right, let me look in Texas and let me look in Florida, especially central Florida. And these are great states, right? Yes. They're, they're booming Huge. states. Mm -hmm. the population growth. Crazy, yeah. yeah, I mean, but that also comes with its downsize, yeah. right? More, more competition. competition. Um, prices have skyrocketed, right? Mm -hmm. The sellers are actually, like, they know, right? They're getting yeah. calls every day uh, from people trying to buy from them. But I said, look, uh, I'm comfortable with those markets, and that was helpful. And then uh, uh, on, like, the asset size, I said, I probably can't jump into something that's, like, 50,000 plus square feet yeah. right away. Although now in hindsight, I think I should have done that. Um, but uh, at the beginning I was like, all right, yeah. let me, let me start small. Absolutely. So I said, you know, what makes sense? Maybe something around 20,000 to 40,000 square feet. Yeah. Also um, I said, all right, what purchase price do I want to pay? Right. And I said, how much money do I have in the bank? How much money do I think I can raise right from investors, friends and family? And I backed into a number saying, well, for this year, for 2022, I wanted to acquire two to three facilities uh, with a value of somewhere between four and six million, right? So I said, well, what's that math? It's roughly one and a half to two million, right, mm -hmm. per facility. And I said, well, that fit the buy box of the size as well. Um, and, you know, over time, I also learned what are important factors. You, you talk about this a lot, right? Market is extremely important. So I said, well, it needs to be in a market where there's, even in Texas, there's some, you know, yeah. areas with declining population. Yep. So Absolutely. there has to be population growth. There has to be a uh, minimum median household income. Uh, and then there can't be too much square foot per capita, right? And like you say this all the time, you guys talk about this, you can't change the market, yep. right? Uh, so, so yeah, that was very important to me. I love it. I, you know, what I really think is important here is how, you know, clear you got with saying, this is my comfort level, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up on things that are important to make this work. So I want to stay within my comfort level and not give up on the things that make it important. And even though you're, you're in Texas um, and Florida, which are big markets and everything, you're right. Those are markets that everybody knows about. Mm -hmm. All the big boys are going in there, everything else. And for even when we got started, Boise uh, wasn't very big. And there was nothing really there. So we, we, and it was too big of a market for us. And so our buy box. So we had to really look outside and we had to go to areas that we were comfortable with that kind of met that area. And so we went to smaller markets that were in the Northwest, right? That, that fit our buy box. But I love how you kind of merge those things together. So this is my comfort level, which is important because if you have a buy box that's, you know, Manhattan and you're from nowhere land, Kansas, you know, and all of a sudden that's just too big. It, even if the right things are right, you're not going to be able to really get it done and execute. So you mentioned you hired a VA. How did you go about that? Cause you have your buy box, you have your areas, you know what you don't want to give up on quality things that make a big deal, right. That are really important that are, could harm you. Um, but how did you go about finding them? Like you hired a VA, what'd they do? And 
what did you instruct them to do? Yeah, so I think it's important to note that before, like I was saying earlier, I hired the VA. I was I did everything on my own, right? Yeah. Because I wanted to know how does it work, right? That included building the lists and calling the owners, um, which is actually quite frightening. I mean, you don't know the person, but you're calling yeah. someone like, hey, do you want to sell to me? <laughs> it's, it's actually frightening. Yeah. But I think me doing it uh, on my own helped me determine what I want to find in a VA, right? And mm -hmm. you could easily find a job description online for a VA yeah. that does cold calling, but I wanted to know like, you know, how it feels to do it and mm -hmm. what processes are important to me. Well, and if you're going to be effective, I mean, you, you need to have that insight. You need to be able to document what's working, not working Absolutely. Uh, for your specific type. I mean, again, whether it's averages, you're, you're looking at Texas as a market as a whole, right? Like, and you just said, very market specific. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's calling, calling facilities, looking at markets, looking at facilities, it's very hyper focused on those small little incremental things. Um, don't take the averages and don't just go out and hire any VA on uh, any yeah. of these platforms and just assume that they're going to go in and do a great job. Like go in, do some of it on your own. Yeah. Build yeah. out the systems and the processes that you identify actually work to be able to actually move quicker on those deals for sure. Yeah. And I think getting a layer tactical here, it was like the most important thing I think was refining the script, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, like absolutely. how do you ask questions yeah. to the sellers? Cause you know, you need unit mix, right? Yep. You, you probably want to know monthly gross revenue. You want to know if they have a price in mind and yep. to get the seller comfortable, you know, you need to refine that script. And I think that's, that's helped a lot. Uh, and then on, on getting the VA, I went, actually went on one of the platforms, right? So it was Upwork and I hired, um, well, I put out a job description for it and I hired from that five different cold callers. Yes. Right. And I gave them 10 numbers and, you know, owner information. And I said, go call. Right. And then I waited for the results. And what I was doing there is like, you know, when I normally want to hire for a job, you go through multiple rounds of interviews and, you know, you, I do case studies. In this case, I just jumped into the case study. Right. And I said, go call owners and let me see what I get back. And I was trying to assess a few things like, you know, the outcome saying like, hey, the seller wants to sell wasn't as important to me. It was how are they documenting Mm -hmm. notes, right? Um, you know, when they reported back to me, what was um, their structure of communicating to me? Um, so I was looking for those, you know, small things. Uh, and out of those five, one stood out. It was a cold caller. It's a cold caller in Jamaica. Uh, and I said, all right, I'm going to bring her on and, and, you know, do this for several hours a week. So smart, man. Doing a split test of BS. Exactly. That's Absolutely. fantastic. Yeah. Love that. I, um, you mentioned too, a few things that are really important in the script, but also then, uh, you, let's say they get that owner on the phone, you need to get a certain amount of information out. So when you're looking at saying, all right, what do I need to understand to move this forward? Not just what do I need to get the owner to do? So I, not just, I need the owner to want to sell. Right. And then it like, what do you need out of it? So unit mix? Yes. Um, but uh, other questions that you can even ask owners on, like, do you have debt on your facility, right? What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, tell me about the work that needs to be done. Because what you need to do is you need to be able to try to cultivate enough information that you can put in your underwriting and say, all right, I know the market. I know you have this many units. I know these are the prices of the units in the market. Here are your prices. I know that you have CapEx. I know that the owner wants to do something. So that way you can go back to that owner and actually present something that can get that ball Absolutely. moving forward even more. And I think a lot of people are just trying to get, um, yeah, you want to sell and what's the price, right? And it, it, to be able to go a level deeper really, really improves those odds. At the end of the day, you're trying to solve a problem of the owner. And if they're a seller, they have a problem. Mm -hmm. They want to sell for whatever reason, right? But the problem may be that they still own it and they, they don't want to. Uh, so you need to really figure that out. And if you guys, if you do have somebody that's doing your cold calling, data is really important. So make sure that that cold caller, that VA um, is working within their spreadsheet. And then they have all these data inputs. And, you know, you may have lines that are just, I couldn't get it. The owner said, I'm not going to tell, whatever. But you want to cultivate that because... You may have things in there. The owner has no debt um, and he would be a seller, but he probably wants a little more than the market can give right now. Well, then you may go, oh, hey, wait, hold on here. He said no because 
price, but he has no debt. Maybe we could do seller financing, right? So with that information, even a no, you may say, turn in. Or you now have that list and that data in. You can create a campaign. You're going to put them on it. You're going to give them cards. You're going right. to stop by. And you can rank those owners and those sellers, right? So you can go back. If you're paying a VA to make calls and they're getting that data, you want that data to be worth something because you're paying for it. And deals, lots of times, take a while to play out. It's just not like, hey, do you want to sell? Yes. Well, how much do you want to sell for? Three million. Well, I'll pay you two. Okay. And it's done. That's not how it works, right? Um, and understanding what you're going to waste time on or not, if that owner's so out of the ballpark, if there needs lots of capital expenditures, and lots of times too, it's not even what you thought. I don't know how right. much you ran in this, but with the information I got, I was like, this is all wrong. Yeah. I actually don't want this deal. Right. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, this is probably not super scalable, but in the beginning, it was really important for me to just drive out, right? If I've spoken to yeah. the owner, you know, they've given me a little bit of information. I would just drive out to the facility. hundred um, percent. Some of the facilities had gates, some didn't, but I think that helped in a couple of ways. I can kind of observe and see, Hey, is there any maintenance that's needed, right? Deferred maintenance that's yeah. needed. Mm -hmm. And I can maybe spot that. Uh, but also like telling the seller, hey, I stopped by, I looked at it, yeah. right? And, 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 and sharing that, I think, prove to, proves to the sellers that serious. I'm serious. Absolutely. For and sure. that's one of the things you got to do right away. Yeah. You got to prove to those sellers that you're serious, you're the real deal. Because even if they are a seller, uh, and I tell people this all the time. Every time somebody calls me, says, hey, I, you know, I don't know how I get on lists, but I occasionally I'll get on a list. They'll call, hey, your, your <laughs> property at blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not selling. And they're like, okay, well, thank you for your day. And got off and I'm like, that was the worst call I've ever received ever, right? Because I don't know who you are. Right. I will never tell you that I'm a seller. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. I don't know your information. Like, for me, you may not even be the buyer. You may simply be trying to do marketing or whatnot. So you've presented me with an option that goes like this. Are you a seller? If I say yes, you're going to have access to information I may not want to because now that's going to lead to a whole other questions. I can't get you off the phone. I don't even know who you are, what you're doing. So I, I'm literally choosing to avoid the conversation, whether I'm a seller or not. And a lot of people don't realize so many of the sellers, they say no, but it's not because they don't want to sell. Mm -hmm. It's because they don't know who you are and they want you off the phone. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I know we've I know we've seen it in our organization even a lot of times where we have those conversations, you know, online or on the phone with potential sellers, and then our team goes and meets with them, and it's a totally different conversation. Yes, it was. I'll never sell. Yep. And it's like, well, yeah. actually, last year. I kind of thought about maybe selling and this yep. is kind of my, it's like totally different. So yeah, kudos actually getting out and seeing the properties, huge amount of value there. Yeah. Or we find out too that, you know, we had this and I think I shared this uh, before, but Brian with our team was working on a deal and the seller came out and said 2.4, right? And the seller was like, we won't entertain anything. There's not even a chance we'd even look at anything under 2 million maybe though, you know, somewhere between two and 2.4, we would sell. And they worked the numbers and they got it to a point where they're like, I think we could do 2 million. So they said, hey, listen, we, we can get to 2 million. Let's do it, why not? They kind of agreed to it and everything. And they kept going back and they're like, it doesn't work at 2 million. So they went back to the seller and they're like, I'm sorry, this, this doesn't work. We can't make this work. And so I was like, fine, you know, whatever. And went away and we we're like, well, you know, whatever. He wants to sell it. Find out the number that we had pegged was, I think, 1.3 or 1.4 million is where it should have been. Three months later, he sold for 1.4. Wow. And they looked at that going, hold on here. W what happened, right? To realize that what that seller was saying was not true at all. He would absolutely sell 2.4. He was saying 2.4 just to see if he could get somebody to pay an astronomical amount. He had to sell though. And he sold at 1.4 million, an entire million less or over 30% less yeah. mm -hmm. than we were told. And we could have gotten it at 1.4. And um, it, it, was, it, it was a really good lesson Brian talks about. He's like, I really learned a lot from that. Whereas like, we, if we would have stuck by our gun and said, hey, we are a serious buyer, we're in this 1.4, we would have ended up with a deal that would have been a great option because the seller, despite what he said, 
actually had to sell. Right. Yeah. So I think there's two, two important things here. One is when you're talking to sellers, no matter how good the conversation is, um, they're not going to remember you, right? You have to Absolutely. stay top, top of mind. Yes. Right. You're just a random caller. Yep. Um, so you have to stay top of mind and that's, you know, being consistent with those calls. But I think if you are able to understand their motivations as you're talking about, um, or meeting them for lunch, then yep. they start to remember you, right? Because yes. you can use their motivations, uh, and, and repeat that back to them in different ways. Yep. Um, so I think, you know, it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, do we call and do we say, uh, you know, do you want to sell now? We do do that, uh, but at times we also just want to, you know, cultivate that relationship and mm -hmm. may not ask that right away. Hundred sure. percent. Now, tell us about your first deal. Mm -hmm. So, how did you find it? How'd that go with the seller? Was it was it on market? Was it not? Walk us through it. Yeah. So the first deal that I closed on was actually through a broker. Okay. Um, so when I start started out, uh, you know, end of last year. Um, I started reaching out to a bunch of brokers, yeah. right? And um, they get this all the time, but I still think it's really important, right? Who, who are the top brokers uh, in my market? And I'm not talking about the big names like Marcus and Millichop, right? They all have smaller kind of offices, I guess, yeah. in, in kind of regional markets, but I'm talking about like the local mm -hmm. uh, brokers. So I searched, you know, Texas self-storage brokers, and you get a list of the local folks or so for example, Texas and Oklahoma or just the Southeast, right? Yeah. Florida, Georgia. Yep. Um, and I hit them up and, you know, I told them, Hey, like I do have a business. Um, so I have some credibility, right? I would tell them my story. Um, so, you know, there's a, actually a little bit of, you know, they want, they'll, they'll pay attention to me. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I just kept in touch with, with the brokers. Uh, and, and one of the brokers brought me a deal that was in, in Texas. It was in the Canyon Lake area. Um, and we had a deal. We were um, negotiating the PSA. And at the last moment, the seller backed out. Um, and we worked hard on that deal. And, um, you know, it sucked that we had to we had to lose out on that. But the broker like knew how motivated I was, right? Whenever he sent me an email, I would respond right away, give him everything he needed to make sure the deal goes through. And I think he saw that. Um, so you know, he got a deal a few months later as a pocket listing and shared it with me. Um, and I said, yeah, this is great. Let's let's jump in. It took another kind of three months from that point uh, to to lock the PSA in, but. Um, yeah, I think cultivating relationship with that broker and showing him I'm motivated, I think helped a lot. Yeah, that I completely agree. Uh, you guys got to remember the broker's number one fear is that you won't close. And so uh, brokers hear from lots of people, but they don't give everyone a shot. And I don't mean that as a stab or a bad thing against brokers at all. It's not possible. How can a broker that has 100 people on his list, give everyone a fair equal shot. Yeah. That is not even plausible. It can't work like that. So they will classify people based upon their serious, they know what they want, that I know who they are and we have a relation, not an email that just says, hey, send me your deals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you and everybody else, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, and so you obviously did a really good job of that. Now, was the second one, or your second deal, did that come from the same broker? No, the second deal, uh, actually, I was brought in uh, to that deal awesome. with partners. Great. Um, yeah, so there's there's a few partners that, you know, we're looking to bring someone on for a little bit more capital. Yeah. Um, with, you know, I think financials knowledge, being able to make sure the bookkeeping is clean. Um, so they brought me on to that deal. And that that's one in Florida. Uh, and the third one that I'm closing on was through cold calling. Yeah. Uh, and then the one that I'm wholesaling was also through cold calling. You know, the... This is a perfect example when we talk about like be the bear. It's like you got to do everything. A lot of people. So how do I find deals? Is it through a broker? Is it through cold calling? I'm like everything. All the above. All <laughs> the above. Get the partnerships, river. networking. Yeah, it's yeah. got to be. I mean everything. You got to be in the right place at the right time. For sure. And you got to put yourself in a position where you have those relationships. You're you're out there. You no, know, and, and look at that. I mean, you got a broker, networking, partnerships, going direct. You got two deals. Uh, that's a perfect example of how you were able to move so quick by utilizing all those means of deal flow, as opposed to maybe sticking with one, which would have produced one result. You got three right. on three different ways. And, uh, and two, by the way, it changes. So there's certain times where certain methods work well, and then other times where it doesn't. So you, you really don't know. Like, 
You don't. I, uh, the next deal that we get, we don't exactly know where it will come from. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's important to stay on top of those things, which it sounds like you had a VA, you were executing on all of them, you're networking, um, and you were meeting with brokers. And that's why it produced. For sure. And you know what I think is very valuable is like putting your goals and ambitions out there. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Telling everyone and anyone you can about that. Absolutely. Um, you know, this is what I want. Like I wanted to lock in you know, two to three facilities this year and just kept repeating that. These are my markets. This is my buy box. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you put things out there into the universe, you know, hopefully over time you'll get some, yeah. you know, something back. Um, and I think that's, that's super key going to events like the one we're at right now. Yep. Um, going to the conferences, meeting as many people and telling them what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you never know, you know, one of those conversations might just click. Absolutely. We've seen it happen over and over again, you know, whether it is events like this or uh, the groups that we're a part of or, you know, the partners that reached out to you and connected on, you know, hey, we need somebody to come in, do the bookkeeping, have a little bit more dialed in, you know, financial understanding, all those different aspects is huge. Um, but one of the questions I did want to ask you was in those initial conversations, those very first conversations that you're having with that potential seller, what do those look like? Yeah, I think they all vary. Um depending on how the, the person we're calling or talking to is reacting, mm -hmm. right? Um, the thing about Texas and Florida, those markets is the sellers know they're getting hit up every single day. Like, yes. you know, when I was calling, I would get things like, yeah, you're my 10th call this week, or, mm -hmm. you know, you're my second call today. Um, and, you know, I think the first thing that was really important for us to convey to the seller is we're not just investors who are coming in and, and you know, just trying to, basically pull off a fast one on you, right? So communicating things like, uh, even though I didn't have my first facility locked in, I'm an operator, yep. right? Yep. Um, I'm one of you, right? Yes. Trying to get that across. Exactly. Um, fake it till you make it, but you know. Yep. Yeah, but <laughs> but absolutely. I mean, but you're operating a business in yeah. storage. Yeah. You're a business yeah. owner, you're an operator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, I think that helps. And sometimes, you know, um, they're like, okay, I don't want to sell and we'll, we'll hang up. That's fine. Uh, but you know, I, I'm trying to understand their motivations. Like we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. like, you know, how will they even entertain an offer? Yeah. Uh, and I think the language is really important. You know, if they say, oh, I don't want to sell saying something like, would you be opposed to hearing an offer? Right? Yeah. Well, I think if someone asked me that, I'd be like, yeah, no, yeah, oh, here, definitely yeah. give me an offer. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sometimes they're like, okay, so what's the offer on the phone? And then you have to be like, all right, well, I'm going to need a little bit more information. Mm -hmm. um, but none of them go according to the script or the plan, right? They're all, sure. they're all uh, yeah. kind of variable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I Walk me through the financial part of this. When, uh, how much of the negotiation with the seller was they were either, were you immediately said that price I'm comfortable with? Or walk me through that. Like, how did you figure out what it was worth? Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, what was really important was to get the unit mix information, right? Um, and without that, I don't think I can, can really do anything. Um, so what, what was important to me was understanding uh, what the rent runway is, right? This yes. is something that you've yeah. taught me. Uh, and really understanding like, okay, where's the facility at? versus the, the competitors, uh, and is there room to push up pricing? I think most of us want to do value add deals where there is room to push up rates. Um, and what I was looking at was, all right, what are current in place rates? What are current street rates, right? For the, mm -hmm. for the subject facility. And how does that compare to competitor rates? Yeah. Um, and then what I'd say is, okay, well, from those competitor rates, what's a similar quality asset, right? What, you know, what do I think I can charge? Um, and, um, when I know that, that kind of market price that I can charge, I then can figure out what my monthly gross potential income can be. Um, so that, that was always very crucial for me. A lot of people do back of the napkin, but for me, like, I just, I love doing that comps analysis right away. Yeah. Um, I have a VA who's actually doing that for me. Um, so it's, it can be quite fast. And I look at that and I say, all right, well, then my back of the napkin kicks in. I say, well, you know, in today's market, let's use 85% occupancy, right? We're not going to use 95% or 90%. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things might be at 90% now, but let's be conservative, yeah, 85%. Uh, usually using like a 35 to 40%. Usually I start with 40% expense ratio, and then I know what my NOI will be, right? Um, and then I'm putting, plugging in what market interest rates are, what I think the debt I can get on that facility. Um, 
as one option and another option is seller financing. And then I know how much cash flow I can potentially make. And that's how I'm kind of uh, uh, crafting the offer. Now, did you, when you were having the discussions with the owner, did the owner come at you pretty, pretty strong right out of the gate? Did they come out and say, hey, listen, this is my number or hey, this is a cap rate that I want. And then did you have to back into it from there or was it actually just more of a blank slate where it was, you just show me an offer? Yeah, so um, some of them are blank slates because the, the seller doesn't doesn't really yeah. know. I mean, they might have a number in mind, but, but you know, yeah. they 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 don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And some of them have been like, no, I want this number. I want two million dollars. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I can only pay you whatever one point four for it. They're like, yeah. no, yeah. I want two million dollars. Um, but I think like trying to explain them why I can only mm -hmm. pay one point four. Think is really important and the three offer strategy that you talk about i think is, is is critical right if you can make their number work with seller financing i'm like okay i can make that number work right yeah. but you're gonna have to seller finance it uh yeah. and by the way here's some pros of seller financing right you get you get to spread out your tax burden um you get to make some more money on interest rates right having yeah. that conversation with them but they yeah they were all over the place and um i think it's funny because in almost all instances we had to go back and renegotiate the price because you learn things Absolutely. right so even mm -hmm. if you settled it on yes. a price that might not be the price yeah. because you learn about you know if you do an inspection on the property and you're like holy crap like yes. so many parts of the roofs are rusted yep mm -hmm. all right that's like 50k i need to pay to you know yep. get a new ceiling on it um so you have to and you know i i, I budget for capex um mm -hmm. but sometimes there's unknowns and and uh you know you need to change the price yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. Was there anything that popped up that was a surprise that, that caught you off guard on any of these deals thus far? Yeah. So the deal that we're closing tomorrow um, requires a lot of CapEx. Mm, yeah. <laughs> we need to do new roof. Um, it's a cinder block building. So we have masonry work. We need to do new asphalt, new paint. Um, and that was really overwhelming, right? Because mm -hmm. I haven't really done anything like that before. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize how I thought, you know, you probably needed like 100 to 150 K of CapEx, but actually, no, I needed double that, like mm -hmm, 300 K yeah. of CapEx. Um, so that was a little bit of surprise. But, you know, I think there is like, all right, for every one of those things, I need to get three to five bids. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And I got three to five bids. And that was part of the kind of due diligence process. Um, and when I calculated that number, I'm like, holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> large yeah. number. <laughs> How'd the owner receive that? So, you know, it's interesting. Um, they they kind of knew yeah they knew i mean if they're not doing maintenance on their facility yep. they know for things. years they know mm -hmm. and you know they didn't come out and say it yep um but when i sh i also shared the bids with them right and i said look like this is what it's going to cost mm -hmm. um and i think you know they were almost like yeah that that makes sense yeah yeah it's i think a lot of people are very scared to have those conversations um but at the end of the day they're also in the game mm -hmm. and they know and, uh, you know, we've talked to people that are like, well, I either don't want to do it or whatnot. So we always say, well, listen, we don't have to take it off the price. So, you know, we'll just close at this price and um, you hire people out on your own and have it done before uh, we close. And then you can take care of it because uh, you're selling us to this as if it works. Right. Um, and that kind of they're going to look at it and they're like, well, I don't know about that. And you're like, well, hold on here. You said that we could have this price and you said that there weren't these issues. We did our due diligence. Right. There are. So, um, you know, and that is not, not having it in a mean way, but just a matter of fact way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, occasionally you get the owners that are just like, I don't even care, screw you or whatnot. And, uh, then that's your, your, your time to say, okay, I'm walking away. Right. Um, but for the most part, no, you said it's not, so how do we remedy this? Right. I fix it, you fix it. Simple, right? Yeah. Uh, it may not be what anyone wants to hear. And obviously, seller, you don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Mm. I don't want to do it. I want the property that was, you know, fine. So I don't think it's as big of a deal as people make it out to be, but a lot of people don't want to have that conversation. And, you know, I it was actually mind-boggling to me to 
um, you know, I heard you, you, you get a, a, a facility under contract and you retrade it, right? I heard this term. Yes. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Just offer what you, you know, what you think yeah. works. And then once you start doing it, you're like, well, no, there's reasons why the price has to decrease. And yes. like, that's normal, yeah. right? It's normal to go back and share these things. Yeah. Um, so I agree with that. And, and um, actually one of the sellers, um, we had to go back to her, the first deal that I closed on. Uh, and she was stuck on the purchase price, right? There was some magical number that yes. mm -hmm. that worked yeah. for her, um, and that, that's a seller finance deal. So we actually just lowered the down payment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. There you go. I was like, well, I need those funds. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So we just lowered the down payment. Good. That's perfect. And, that, and that's what it's you. about. Yeah. How on on all three of these deals? How did you finance? Yeah, um, they're all different. Yeah. All, all three deals. So the first one, seller financing, uh, we got uh, five percent. But we, we paid a little bit over, right, yeah. for that, which is on seller financing, 5% uh, interest rate. Um, the second one um, was bank financing. Bank, actually, we brought on a hard money lender um, for, I'd say it's probably going to be 30 to 60 days, and then we're going to refinance that out with the, with the bank loan mm -hmm. just because that was faster. Uh, and the third one, uh, I have investors that are coming on it, on in the deal. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's awesome, man. Um, you know, this is in times where there's no deals, you can't get financing, you can't get investors. This is what I'm hearing all the time. And, you know, it's not true. You're knocking them out. You're getting them done. <laughs> um, I think it, you're, you're, one of the things you're doing a really good job is though, you are looking at this three dimensional where you're trying to solve problems. You're saying, all right, let's dig a little deeper. I'm surprised how many people just don't dig a little deeper and then the answer's right there and they can't come up with it and they, the deal falls apart and they yeah. walk away. Uh, that is actually really, really common. We find this, especially on market deals. I can't pay that much and then they walk away. And you're just like, you literally looked at a price and that was, you just, oh, I, I, that's not worth it or I can't pay that. And then you moved on. And it's like, you didn't even try. You didn't, you didn't even go down the road. Mm -hmm. You didn't even- No conversations. You know, nothing. Right. It, it's, and it, how do you expect to get deals done that way? You can't blame an owner for saying, you know, if I'm selling a facility that's worth five million, and I'm putting it out at ten million, and somebody's going to pay me ten million, good for me, right? And you can't blame me for trying to get six or seven if it's worth five, right? That's not a bad thing that I'm trying to maximize my price. Now it's your job if you don't want to pay six or seven million to come back and tell me why you think it's five, and then it's my job to decide if I'm going to if it's worth that or not. Um, but just expecting the seller to give you it how you want it at the price you want it <laughs> in the way you want it is unreasonable. Um, and you should, you shouldn't be doing this game because it's not how it works. Uh, I think hindsight's 2020 and a lot of people see deals. They assume the deals went down. Like people say, how do you find a deal? We don't, we make them. Right. And uh, that's a perfect example of all these deals. You made these deals. You didn't find them. It's not like you had a connection. It's not like anything else. You went out, you did the work, you figured out solutions, you looked at problems, things weren't as they either seemed or should have been, and you pivoted and you moved and you made it work. And that is, I think, the difference, honestly, between a successful investor and not, is they, they figure it out and they make it work, regardless of the time, regardless of the project, right? If you can't find anything here, you move on and you go to another market, right? And you do, you, you make the changes that you need to do. And then you can be successful in any market. Yeah, yeah. And obviously like finding the deal is the toughest thing yeah. right now. But you know, I also hear people say, well, how am I gonna pay for it? Yeah. And like, I'm telling you, if you have a good deal, no matter who you are, you'll be able to find the capital. Yes, right? absolutely. Like, if it's a good deal. The capital will follow. A, a bank will want to finance it. Yep. You can bring on a partner. Heck, yep. if, if you have a good deal, come to me, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I'll find the absolutely. money. Um, and, and I feel like some people put that as an obstacle in front of them. And I think like it's easier to say, right, while we're talking right now, but but really that shouldn't be an obstacle. If you have a good deal, the money will come. Yeah, a hundred percent. Other people, you have the money and you don't have deals. If you have the money, deals will come. Let people know you got the money. They'll mm -hmm. find deals for right. you. Yeah. Right. There's ways to do this. There's ways to get it done. Some people may have the money. Other people may have the deal and you may have the ability and knowledge to do it. 
that you create it, you make it work together, right? If it was about, if the fact that you didn't, don't have the money to buy the deal, that's why you can't do it. I would never buy any deal. I don't have the money to buy all the deals. Are you kidding me? We have 300 million in assets. <laughs> that's not how the real estate works, right? Right. It's just not how business works. That's not how wealthy people get wealthy. And uh, it doesn't take a lot, but you do need to do the work and you gotta go through it. You gotta learn, you gotta learn it. You gotta put in the time and the effort. You gotta solve problems and do a little digging. And that yielded extremely amazing results for you. And I just think it's it's awesome, dude. It really yeah. is. Congratulations. Yeah, thank man. you. I'm excited. A little overwhelmed, but yeah. excited. Yeah, yeah exactly. Dude, three at once, man. That's right. <laughs> Having triplets. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right. My That's sister awesome, just man. had twin, or they're one now, yeah. and I'm like, I saw how hard it was for them. I'm like, yeah, this is like having triplets. Wow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, well, maybe we should just done one at a time. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, wait, now tell us, you know, what are your goals? What are you trying to do? Where are you moving? Yeah, uh, I would say, you know, two things are really important for me. Um, the first one is continue scaling, right? Yes. Um, I think three was a goal for this year. Two to three was a goal for this year. I hit that mark. I need to do my goals in Q4 for next year, but, you know, probably want to do three to five next year, right? Yep. I want to continue scaling, scaling things up. Um, we talk about this or you talk about this a lot and share this with us. Like, obviously, we can never time the market, right? So you always have mm -hmm. to be in the game. Um, yeah. And, you know, if you're not in the game, next thing you know, like you're losing out. Um, yeah. So I want to stay in the game, even in this market. And, uh, you know, related, the, the second thing is, is related, which is, you know, three facilities is a lot right now. Uh, and there's only so much time I have. Right. Yes. So I actually need to go out there and, you know, bring on uh, someone like an asset manager. Mm -hmm. Right. Or yep. someone who could more handle the day to day of the facilities. We have boots on the ground. We have a call center, but I need someone who can kind of oversee that. hundred um, percent. So, yeah, the two things are continuing to scale, uh, buy more facilities um, and then, you know, build a team to help me do this because I'm not going to be able to do it on my own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'd say, uh, you know, excited to see you grow and everything. We'll have you on next year. But you know, geez, we may need you to have it on you in a month and you may have five more yeah. deals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, knock on wood, yeah. knock on wood. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for coming on, man, and sharing yeah. your wisdom. And I think being a, a, an example to a lot of people out there, uh, one of the things that I, I worry about is just that, um, you know, maybe they look at our size and resources and they, they use that idea where it's like, well, you can do it because you have that. And I try to explain to people, no, my problems are just that much bigger than yours. Right. It's actually much, it would be way easier for me if it was just me and I just had to find money and a deal to one deal or two deals. Mm -hmm. It's way harder yeah, yeah. to solve these issues that we're doing. And a lot of people don't realize that doesn't change. So what you just did, you'll be doing the exact same thing when you're at 20 million, 50 million, a hundred or a billion. It doesn't change. And so I love, and I, I love hearing you and see you because it's like, it gets me fired up. I'm like, I'm ready to go tackle my problems. Yeah. I'm ready to go figure <laughs> sure. it out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. thank you for coming on and sharing that with people and, and giving them a little insight, man. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Heck Appreciate yeah. you guys. For sure, dude. Yeah, Proud absolutely. Of you. Awesome. Nice job. Thanks everybody for listening. We're so excited that we've rolled out our community with over 300 plus members, all doing self-storage. That's right. They're buying, they're developing, they're operating, they're managing. And this includes all of our webinars that go into deep underwriting, legal issues, all the things that you need to know to operate your self-storage business, how to find the best deals, how to analyze markets. That includes a due diligence checklist and our underwriting modeler. So join our community today with over 300 self-storage nerds.